Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Revival and Reformation, and it's a series that we are studying between July and September of 2013. This is lesson number 12 in that series for September 21 of 2013. It's entitled Reformation, Healing Broken Relationships. How much do human relationships have to do with finishing the gospel? That'll be one of our big questions. I hope you have your Bible handy. If not, we would really encourage you to grab it because we're going to look at a lot of Bible passages. And for those of you who listen to this program, sometimes to maybe get a few ideas about things you might want to ask or discuss in your Sabbath school class, our materials are available on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, Org. As always, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, with great expectations, we are looking forward to the final events in this earth's history. As we look around us, we can hardly believe that it can be long before that will happen. And now we ask ourselves, what are the reasons why you have not been able to come back yet? Is it because we can't get along as human beings? What are, the, what are the problems in our relationships? What could we do to make them better? What can we learn from the New Testament Christians about relationships? Help us to comprehend and take into our own lives the lessons we learn here as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Resolving conflicts, differences, and issues that arise between members of the church. What a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, we know, this is true about marriages and it's true about other things, that the closer two human beings or a group of human beings get to each other, uh, the more likely it is that there's going to be some kind of friction. Um, the early Christian church saw differences arise between their members. They had problems. They're human. Jesus himself also gave us some directions, some instructions, some examples of how to deal with such issues. So what, what can we learn from the scriptures and what can we learn from Christian principles about how to deal with such issues? When it comes to relating to the community, I mean, let, let's just lay the cards on the table to begin with. When it comes to relating to the community, how the church lives is much more important than what the pastor says. And I quote from Ellen White, let us remember that a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity, and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldling. Some of you may remember that uh, Mahatma Gandhi is quoted as saying, I like your Christ, I just said I don't see his example very often in your Christians. Not all the books written can serve, going back to Ellen White, not all the books written can serve the purpose of a holy life. Men will believe not what the minister preaches, but what the church lives. Too often the influence of the sermon preached from the pulpit is counteracted by the sermon preached in the lives of those who claim to be advocates for truth nine volume of the testimonies, page 21, paragraph one, and then this one to go along with it. The most powerful evidence a man can give that he has been born again and is a new man in Christ Jesus is the manifestation of love for his brethren, the doing of Christ-like deeds. This is the most wonderful witness that can be born in favor of Christianity and will win souls to the truth. And that was from a talk given by Ellen White when she first arrived home from Australia, and, and the talk was given on July 1 of 1900, it's paragraph 13 in that series. And one more from Signs of the Times, August 16, 1905, the life of a true, lovable Christian is the most powerful argument that can be produced in favor of the gospel. I mean, you know, how can we argue with statements like that? And where did she get that idea? Look what it says in John 13. You remember 
John 13, 34, and 35. I'm going to start with 34. And Jesus is with his disciples. He's just about to leave the upper room. He's talking to them the last night he has with them before his crucifixion. And now I give you, he says, and now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Now, we have commandments to love each other all the way back into Leviticus. So this is not a new commandment. So now he talks about the new part. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that's probably new. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. What does that imply about the way the rest of the world lives? It's quite a comparison. <laughs> quite a comparison. Have any of you ever had the privilege of being in a church that acted like that? You know, I'm having a little trouble with the words that you just gave me mm -hmm. there. Um, Christ-like example. Well, what comes into your mind there? Is it that guy in the Bible? Mm -hmm. um, what about um, love your neighbor? Love, love the members? Love, um, I think I love them. Okay. You? How much do you have to love them? Yeah, how much? <laughs> Good question. How much you got? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I would, I mean, all I can tell you is from my personal example, we had a, a short time when I was attending Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. We belonged to a small church in northern Baltimore. And that church was on fire. I can tell you, we had all sorts of programs going on. People in the community, and that was in the early days of the five-day plan to stop smoking, people in the community were signing up a, a month or two in advance to get into our five-day plans to stop smoking. It w and then there was, e was cooking classes and there were exercise classes, and that little church almost doubled its membership in nine months. So, I mean, that's, that's I mean, it's pretty hard to argue with that kind of a, of a thing. Now, not all those people were brand new Adventists. Some of them were people who said, had come from other Adventist churches and say, wow, you know, there's, there's action going on over here. We want to be a part of it. So, but it was, it was I mean, I, I, I can't forget those days. It was really something. Okay, if, if you want to use Christ as an example for love, I can pick out the cross. That's the big thing. Mm -hmm. I can pick out um, forgiving Peter. That would be a big thing, and maybe even forgiving the whole bunch that ran out on him. Yeah. So what other things can you pick out besides this preacher telling you what, how you should be doing things that would, would kind of give me an example, of a visible example that I should see being done in the church? I'll give you a good example, in my opinion. Christ walked probably somewhere close to 100 miles with his disciples to travel way up near Tyre in Lebanon, would be Lebanon today, to heal the daughter, the, the presum presumably demon-possessed daughter of a woman up there who was not even an Israelite. She was a Canaanite. Okay, One of those tribes that was supposed to have been destroyed and eliminated way back in the days of Moses and Joshua. And Jesus walked up there just to help that woman. Well, yeah, that's a that's an example. That <laughs> yeah, they, that's I think, an example. I mean, I could I could I, probably I, I, find a human, somebody else, even in my life that I could probably um, parallel uh, with that. But Christ, you know, uh, it's almost like if you did what he said, well then, and then you had faith that he was actually doing what he said. Well, then that's how you get your your example of his lovingness, mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, preachers preach all kinds of things and they don't live, yeah. you know, the way they preach. To, uh, to so me, he, uh, sorry, to me, he, uh, he could mix, and he did mix with the high and the low. Mm -hmm. He was not bothered by anybody. And exactly. even in the strata of society he lived in, there were certain people didn't mix w with each other. And he never, ever seems, from what we have there, and I, I think it's definitely true, 
he mixed with everybody, treated yeah. them the same, and regarded them the same as all being s uh, valuable on the same level. Yeah. I, I like the t I like the part where he turned the tables over in the temple and <laughs> pointed his finger at the at the preachers of his day and called them a bunch of snakes. Now is that is that can I, is that okay? Well, that's one of the things we want to discuss. Uh, there's a whole chapter, almost a whole chapter, John eight, where you know he stands up to these guys who could have stoned him on the spot. I, I'm surprised they didn't, except probably the Holy Spirit prevented it. And ended up calling them, you know, you are of your father the devil. They called him a Samaritan. And, uh, you know. That, that isn't normally what we think of when we, when we think of Christ-like. No, but that's part. If we're going to be truly Christ-like, when it comes time to stand up for the truth, we need to stand up for the truth. We just need to have the wisdom to know when that time is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Most of us don't have that wisdom. That's right. I think for me, too, it's selflessness. He mm -hmm. yeah. never was anything focused on him necessarily, but always uh, reaching out. And I, mm -hmm. I think one thing that uh, ver reverberated for me in reading the lesson was how we tend to get so scatterbrained and, and unfocused by what we have going on around us. Yeah. And that we keep coming back to the very simple statements. Uh, love, not, well, you need to do 10 things and this is what you do tomorrow. It's very simple. And I think that that helps us to realize it's a focus item as well. Yeah. Probably if, if I were to pick out something in, in my mind, if you read the book Desire of Ages, which, of course, I hope many of you done many times. And you go to the two chapters that talk about the life of Jesus as a child in Nazareth. He would give his lunch to people who were hungry. He would, he would not retaliate when he was abused by other kids in his age. I mean, that is not normal human behavior. <laughs> I mean, those, those two chapters just blow me away. And that's another example of I, what I think is unbelievable love. How do, you, how do we know this? Because I've never read that in the Bible about Jesus as a child. Well, I mean, and that would depend upon what you believe about the inspiration of Ellen White. I think she was shown it by, you know, by God. Well, turning to some examples of differences that we have spelled out in Scripture to see what happened to them. Look at Acts 13, verse 13. Paul and his companions sailed from Paphos, that would be in the Isle of Cyprus, and came to Perga, a city in Pamphylia. So he's gone from the island over to the mainland, where John Mark left them and went back to Jerusalem. What do we know about John Mark, just briefly? He's the one that left Paul and got Paul upset. Yes, wow. okay. In this example, do we know, what else do we know about him? He was close to a teenager at this time, wasn't he? Or pretty yeah, young, anyway. Yeah, maybe in his early 20s, but maybe even still a teenager. This incident created quite a bit of a, of a quotes, a division mm -hmm. um, in the church, certainly between two prominent leaders, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas separated, and Barnabas felt that there was a still something good in Mark and and mm -hmm. went off with him and Paul just kind of washed his hands to the whole affair it would appear. Now we're told elsewhere that <coughs> John Mark was Barnabas's cousin. I might have had something to do with his uh, willingness to be a little more tolerant of John Mark. And we're also told later on that Mark was one of the last people to be by Paul's side. Mm -hmm. Eventually one of his most trusted uh, associates in those troubling days. Well, here's what happened shortly after that first episode, as you know, or well, when, after, when they were ready for their second uh, evangelistic series. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brothers and sisters in every town where we preach the word of the Lord, and let us find out how they're getting on. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, but Paul did not think it was right to take him because he had not stayed with them to the end of their mission, but had turned back and left them in Pamphylia. There was a sharp argument, and they separated. Barnabas took Mark and sailed off for Cyprus, while Paul chose Silas and left, com commending by the 
commended by the believers to the care of the Lord's grace, he went through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. So uh, one thing that you might say, well, I'm sorry that they had a disagreement, but now we have two teams working instead of just one. Is that a, is that a good thing? Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles, page 170, this desertion caused Paul to judge Mark unfavorably and even severely for a time. Barnabas, on the other hand, was inclined to excuse him because of his inexperience. He felt anxious that Mark should not abandon the ministry, for he saw in him qualifications that would fit him to be a useful worker for Christ. We, we just a moment ago, I, I've been thinking about this, suggested that he might still be a teenager. I'm pretty sure that's not true because Mark 14, 15, I'm sorry, 51 and 52 mentions that he, someone, and I'm pretty sure it was Mark, went out to Garden of Gethsemane following the disciples. And that would have been in AD 31. We're now talking about dates round about AD 40, 45, 46. So if he was already a teenager in, in AD 31, so 15 years later, he would be way more than a teenager. So, but probably not 30 yet, because at 30, he would be regarded as a ready to preach and ready to work. While the differences between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark may have actually furthered the gospel by resulting in two teams traveling around instead of just one, we can rejoice that the differences between Paul and John Mark were resolved, as several of you, of you have mentioned, Later on, Paul says at least twice, you know, get John Mark, bring him with you. And another place he says, I'm so thankful that Mark is still here with me. He's one of just a few Jewish believers that are here and supporting me. So we can be sure, although we don't know exactly how that, res how that problem was resolved, it certainly was resolved. There's a little bit more complex story found in Philemon. What do we know about the little book of Philemon? Paul wrote it from jail. He wrote okay. it to um, a former slave owner. Yes, by the name of Philemon. About his runaway slave, and Onesimus. He, he may not have been a former slave owner. He was a former owner of this slave. Yeah. He may have had other slaves that we don't know. And if you look at the, the, the New Testament carefully, we can't be sure about this, but it seems quite likely that the church probably at Colossae or possibly at Laodicea met in Philemon's house. And um, here's, a, here's a church leader who has a slave. We don't know at what point the slave ran away. And what happened with this slave? Converted or repented or? Somehow or other, he came across Paul in Rome. Now, Paul does not mention anything about him being imprisoned, and he takes the liberty of sending him home. So apparently, he was not in prison. So how did, Paul was in his, you know, he was sort of under house arrest. How do you suppose he met Onesimus? We don't have any idea. <clears throat> but maybe someone told Onesimus, and Onesimus somehow or other got interested in the story. Maybe he heard, maybe heard rumors about what had happened to his master. We just don't have any idea. But while he was in Rome, what happened to Onesimus? Change of heart. Yes, and after he had become a Christian, what happened? Paul sent him back to home with a letter. Mm -hmm. Calling in his good deeds that he'd had done for his friend uh, Philemon. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, why didn't Paul condemn slavery? Well, it was, a, it was a part of the economic system, is, is slavery. That's the way the whole system operated. Mm -hmm. There are estimates that there were up to 60% of the population of the Mediterranean world were slaves. We think we're not slaves, but the Proverbs, what, 22.7 says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave of the lender. Mm -hmm. And how many people borrow for, for one reason or you another? You think that's the way people are supposed to live today. I know we think it's we think we're free, but uh, that we can kid ourselves. <laughs> Credit cards. <laughs> well, we know that Paul grew up in a in a society where slavery was considered normal. So I think well, first of all we need to notice that Paul had apparently overcome his prejudice prejudice against slavery, or against slaves. 
and he was willing to put his personal reputation on the line for this runaway slave. Why do you suppose he did that? Well, if you notice also, he used slave as a metaphor lots of times for his, for our relationship to God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being possessed by God, you know, as like a, like a slave would be, that, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like it was um, normalized, mm -hmm. even though it shouldn't have been, I don't think. Yeah. Um, I, 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 here, you know, in history, you know, before the Civil War, there was a lot of arguments for having slaves as long as you followed his his advice and mm -hmm. all that. And you know, well, it, Philemon was used as one of those arguments in favor of slavery. That's right. That's right. So, the normalizing effect did have a an effect later on. A slave was trying slavery was trying to be wrung out of. Mm -hmm. the states here. Well, what did Paul ask Philemon to do? Accept him without the usual end of a slave that was caught. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. that was the law. And Paul used some subtle and not so subtle diplomacy, didn't he? <laughs> he says, um, whatever, whatever he owes you, put that to my account. And of course, I don't need to remind you that you owe your very life to me. And <laughs> did Paul expect to pay anything back? No. And I'm going to come check up on you. And I expect to be there pretty soon, and I hope you have the room ready for me. <laughs> and I know who will be helping me when I get there, <laughs> right? We have, we have no idea why, um, why Onesimus left, do we? No, no, we, we don't. don't. know if he just got tired of slavery and left, or whether he stole something and had to leave, flee, or, or uh, maybe there was some misunderstanding. And he, yeah. What 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 uh, what would have happened if Paul had written a letter, a fiery letter, saying we need to stop slavery? I don't think it was feasible. It wouldn't even make sense. Yeah. It's not something because it was the norm, mm -hmm. and I don't think it was it was seen as we see slavery. Mm -hmm. it's people owed things and they paid for it. Yeah. In the Caribbean, they have children. People just hand their children to a family where, uh, to pay their what they owe and the child cleans and it, it, it's done today mm. in certain parts of the world and, it, and it's the norm. It was even down here in, in uh, Orange County, mm. in Irvine, just a week, a couple of weeks ago. Oh yes. So yeah. I mean. Do we have any idea what the outcome was of Paul's writing this letter to Philemon? What happened to Onesimus? We don't know for sure, but the letter, of course, was sent to Philemon, and, 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 and along with Onesimus went along with some other people, and he apparently sent uh, the letter of Ephesians at the, and Colossians at the time, same time he sent Philemon. Um, they, and we believe it, they, were, they were written during the very, near the very end of his first imprisonment in Rome. Well, very, for, as a result, very few scholars question the authorship of Philemon, um, but there's a very interesting letter from an ancient church leader, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. Remember, what was Paul's home church? Antioch. Yeah. Antioch. Ignatius lived somewhere around AD 35, so he was born just shortly after the death of Christ, and lived to somewhere around 105 to 110, somewhere in there. At least twice mentioned in his letter, um, talking about Paul and so forth, he, he says, he mentions this letter, I'm sorry, let me get the, this straight again. This letter was written to the Bishop of Ephesus, who was a man named Onesimus. Now that's particularly significant, significant because, now, now let's be honest, Onesimus is a word that in Greek means useful, and it was a common name, especially for slaves. So we can't be sure that this is the same Onesimus. But it's very interesting to note that there's Onesimus who was a bishop of Ephesus for a considerable period of time. And we also know that Ephesus turned out to be the publication center for the early Christian church, a place where you know, letters and different things came in and they kept make co making copies and sending them out to different places. 
it's quite possible that Onesimus had something to do with some of those early publications and sending them out and so forth. Um, it's fascinating to consider the possibility that this same slave Onesimus may have later been the bishop or elder of Ephesus and it may have helped to put together our New Testament as we now know it. And this letter may be there. This little tiny letter, which was like one page of, on, on a papy one papyrus page, this tiny letter might be in the New Testament just because Onesimus was the one who helped out in that work and it sort of gave him some authenticity because here he is, Paul says, you know, this letter was written about him. Do we have any other examples of books that were kind of written to bolster the position of people in the Bible? Ruth. Ruth. Why do you say that? Uh, tells about the ancestors of King David yeah. and Jesus. Ruth, a Moabitess, who was the daughter-in-law of Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho, whose son was Boaz. They were the great-grandparents of King David. So this helps to tell the story of David. And just as perhaps this, story, this little book of Onesimus helps to tell the story of a, an important person in the New Testament. You know, going back to your question about why didn't Paul preach fiery things against um, slavery, mm -hmm. that's a good illustration to think about as far as picking your battles. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, some battles are not, shouldn't be fought at a certain time, and that definitely was not a battle to fight then. Yeah. His mission was to tell the truth about God. Mm -hmm. It would have distracted and probably cause controversy of things that probably would have put everything in the background. Might have destroyed the Christian church. Same thing with mm -hmm. Romans 13. Yeah. You know, your battle is not against the civil government. You're, it's to tell the truth. Yeah. He, he was in and out of enough trouble. If you look at the history of Rome, I don't think Rome would have gotten as powerful without slaves as it was. I think yeah. that's fairly well documented. Yeah. Now in that vein though, you know, when when John the Baptist um, criticized Herod mm -hmm. for his wife, yeah. do you think that was a good battle to fight at that time? Well, at the end of his life, too. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> well, it's very easy for us who become, as we become Christians and join the Christian church, to go through a certain metamorphosis of change as, as we, you know, when we first come into the church, you think, boy, I'm going to get myself together. I'm going to become like Jesus. I'm going to be, you know, ready for the kingdom. And after a while, we realize it's not that easy. It's hard work. I mean, it, there's efforts. I mean, I'm trying to say that we need to work our way into heaven, but we realize it's not as easy as we might have thought to give up those favorite sins and so forth and so forth. And the natural tendency is to do what? Start looking around and see what the other church members are doing and saying, well, Joe Blow is not doing so well either, so maybe I'm not. And oh, Sister Sue is having some problems, so maybe it's all right if I'm not perfect. That's a very natural tendency. Reminds me of some presidents. Yeah. Start looking at the <laughs> other presidents and saying, well, he did that and he did this, yeah. so I'm not so bad after all. <laughs> what? Yeah. If I may. Uh, Although they didn't speak against slavery per se, but they spoke against yeah. injustice because they couldn't deal with the slavery issue because that's the way it was, but they spoke against injustice. And even Moses way, way back uh, when he left the Pharaoh's home to go be with his own parents. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, a lot of people in the Bible stood for what's right. Mm -hmm. and they may not have tried to fight the system. Even Jesus himself, when they speak about the coin, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Certain mm -hmm. things are just the way they are, but in, in, even in those things, we should try to find justice, some kind of balance. Yeah. Well, it's, it's pretty clear that if everybody felt about slaves and treated them as Paul treated Monesimus, slavery problem would disappear, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> in, in, in relating to others within the church, there's several verses we need to look at. We don't have to try time to read all of these. 
Remember that in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says to the church that was squabbling in Corinth, he says, some of you think you're following Apollo, some of you think you're following me, some of you think you're following Peter maybe, others think you're following Jesus directly. The church is not supposed to divide up like this. We're all supposed to be together. And of course, they, he goes on to talk about how uh, we should, uh, later in, in that book, how we're really all different parts of the same body. I mean, uh, the foot doesn't do the same thing as a hand. The hand doesn't do the same thing as an ear. The ear doesn't do the same thing as an eye. We, we, need, to, we need to rejoice in our different talents and pull together as a Christian church. Um, it's very interesting that he makes some comments. We don't have time now to talk about the Corinthian letters. There were probably four letters actually written to Corinth. Uh, after writing the first two, Paul realized things weren't going very well, and he wrote a very strong letter, and part of that letter is probably found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 to 13. And notice these very interesting words, a part of that fiery letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Of course, and this is Paul's words now, of course we would not dare to classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. How stupid they are. They make up their own standards to measure themselves by, and they judge themselves by their own standards. Well, couldn't we all make up standards where we would look pretty good? As for us, however, our boasting will not go beyond certain limits. It will stay within the limits of the work which God has set for us, and this includes our work among you. And since you are within those limits, we were not going beyond them when we came to you bringing the good news about Christ. So we do not boast about the work that others have done beyond the limits God set for us. Instead, we hope that your faith may go and that we may be able to do a much greater work among you, always within the limits God has set. In other words, if, I'm, if it's my job to be an I, let me do the very best job I can of being an I, right? Um, it's, and it's certainly not our job to be judges of others and how they're doing. Um, look at, um, well, just one more comment, I guess, about looking at others. When we look at others, what do we tend to do? Compare ourselves. Compare ourselves. and. We either think we're doing great because we managed to put them down, in which we, there's a tendency for us to feel kind of arrogant, or if we compare ourselves to somebody that's doing, we end up thinking, well, that person's doing better than I'm doing. We may feel really depressed or, or dejected. And neither one of those attitudes do any good for the, for the Christian witness, do they? They're not the kind of attitudes that promote Christianity at all. So judging is just out. Well, what do we learn from God's forgiveness? What does that teach us about how we should relate to others? Look at these verses in chapter 5 of Romans, starting with verse 8. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more then will we be saved by him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will, be, will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. And of course, you recognize that that's the Good News translation, where it doesn't just talk about those long Latin words. It talks about making people God's friends. Um, what did Christ teach us himself, even on Golgotha, about forgiveness? Forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And what were they doing? Telling him he had a devil in him, nailing him to it. Well, this, is, this is on Golgotha. You're, okay. you're back to John 8. Okay. This is further down. On Golgotha, what, what were they doing? They were nailing him to the cross. As he says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Amazing. Really now, and earlier he says, forgive, and then someone says seven times seven, he said, or excuse me, 70 times seven, mm -hmm. and really what he's saying is always be forgiving. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are those that uh, say, oh, we got to have justice. Now, if you forgive, forgive the wrongs, maybe you'll win them over, and, and maybe God will come to your, to your aid better than if you're trying to promote your own self-centered yeah. uh, 
What if yeah, they had known what they were doing? They wouldn't have done it. Well, he, he should never have been there. I mean, think about, what do you suppose the Sanhedrin would have done if they really knew who it was they were condemning to death? Well, does the devil know what he's doing? Do evil angels know what they're doing? Isn't it possible some humans could know what they're doing? While they behave like that, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do we forgive them? Well, what are the reasons why we need to forgive our friends, well, friends and or, quote, enemies that uh, we have differences with? Why do we need to forgive people? For our own mental well, well-being, for yeah. number one, because if you spend your energies me mentally, emotionally, physically dealing with the, something that you probably have no control over anyway, mm -hmm. you're going to destroy yourself. I, unfortunately, I will have to say, and I'm... I'm Forgive me for this, but I, when I first went to Africa many years ago, I worked with some nurses who were trained in a very different system than we were, and those nurses absolutely believed that it was their responsibility to tell me what to do and when I should do this and how I should do it and what I should use, etc. And I was not used to that kind of <laughs> direction, and I said, I, I'm happy to listen to your opinion, but I will also make, I have, also have my opinion. And I tell you, we had some fiery disagreements. And it came to the point, there were times when I would walk around the building instead of, if I knew they were in the hallway, I would walk around to the back side so I didn't have to meet them in the hallway. Um, and I, I'm sure some of the rest of you have had that kind of an experience too, some time or another. I won't, so, ask, I won't ask you to confess. So tell us about forgiveness now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, I wonder. forgive you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> is forgiveness really a process of God? Does he do that? Yes. That's, everybody's that, forgiven. No, no, no. Are they, are they at a point in his mind where they need to be forgiven if he already loves them? Well, in, in God's case, forgiveness is automatic. Well, he is. Well, that's the way he is. Not only automatic. Well, you're you're supposing if you say automatic, that means it does. He does hate them for a while, and then no, he no. needs to get them no, forgiven. No, 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 no. Well, that's what it suggests, really, because no. if if God never gets to the point where he needs to forgive them because he always loves them, well, um, when is that happening? Yeah. When is that forgiveness happening? I, I understand your logic. I just don't necessarily agree with it. Well, um, <laughs> here's here's the thing: God forgives us, and and I I've been thinking about this a lot because there was we had some very interesting discussions a few days ago about this issue. I think God talks a lot about forgiveness, not because it's an, an issue in His mind, but because we need it. That's right. We need to realize that God has forgiven us. We need to think that we are forgiven. We need yes. to know that he's not holding it against yeah. us, which he never did. And that can, if us. you could finally get your mind wrapped around that, then that could perhaps drop that perceived barrier on your part, yeah. your, your perception on your part, that there is no barrier, doesn't have to be a barrier between you and, and the Creator God yeah. who can heal you. Second Corinthians 5 is a famous chapter. The last few verses there, look at verses 20 and 21. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal to us. We plead on Christ's behalf. And this is Paul saying, let me speak on God's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. I mean, that's incredible. Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might be share the righteousness of God. Wow. How does an enemy get turned back to a friend? Through prayer. Okay. I mean, what's, what's really happening there? Well, I hope that it's, it, 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 it happens because people realize that whatever the differences were, were foolish. We're foolish. So it's, it's, you're praying that those kind of thoughts will come into the person that will, and so that all that tension will, will melt. Let me, let me give you an example 
which I wish it had happened more, but I don't know if it does. Yeah, my, my childhood, and I, I think probably a lot of other people in, in their early Christianity, probably, they, people, many people feel like when they sin, they don't deserve God's forgiveness. And they're embarrassed, they're almost too embarrassed to pray. And when they finally read a chap of verses like the ones we just read, they might say, hey, you know, God, does God really want that? Does he really want me to be his friend? In other words, he doesn't hold it against me that I just committed a whole bunch of sins. No, he doesn't hold it against you because you committed a bunch of sins. Well, where did people wow. get that idea at the first place that you can't forgive, you can't be forgiven? Do, do, Maybe it's did you really want me to answer that question? That's Satan's <clears throat> lie, and he would have you th think that God is not fair but to give graciousness <clears throat> to, to, to sinners and not doing it for him. Well, and, Satan and, didn't teach me that. Could, why? Well, that's... <laughs> it could also be an outgrowth of, of uh, this is kind of extrapolating some things here, kind of, but it could about be an outgrowth of... Um, of um, the Holy Spirit impressing you that you have sinned. Yes. And you become aware of, of this. And um, you need the news that. For, for whatever, I, I guess maybe we'd say the devil tells you you can't be forgiven or something. I, I, well, I, I like that. I'm not sure. There's not something in the human consciousness here, but it's a response to, part of it is a response to. You know, I've done something wrong here yeah. that's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. And uh, I don't deserve to be forgiven in a way. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I don't have to deserve it. Well, here's the, here's the problem. Let's, let's look at Christianity historically. The church has promoted this view in the past to the max. And why have they promoted it? Because if you make people feel like they're hopeless and helpless and so forth like this, then you can say, okay, give us all your money and we'll forgive you. Careful now. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. This is, this is historical fact. Yeah, you think it's grown from that or is it absolutely. just them taking advantage of what was there in the first place? Well, because I don't know how that would genetically transfer to me because nobody's done that to me. But isn't, isn't that kind of an extension of the old sacrificial system when you did something wrong you were supposed to bring in yeah. whatever resources you had in those cases it was animals or whatever and and uh, well instead of money you gave them yeah. your animals and then you were that, that worked things out there I think Paul <laughs> gave us maybe the simplest most direct brief r remedy to that whole problem he says Romans 2 4 God's kindness is supposed to lead us to repentance. God's kindness is supposed to lead us to repentance. If we recognize the truth about God's character, it will impact us in ways that are really almost unbelievable. And I, I think I want to agree with Ken that <clears throat> in my life, I didn't feel like I was polarized good or bad. I was just sort of in the middle. Mm -hmm. And kind of going along thinking I wasn't stepping on anybody's toes, wasn't causing any problems. Mm -hmm. and to realize that the middle ground is no ground. Mm -hmm. And that God's kindness, which came to me uh, with a church home, uh, that really wooed me in mm -hmm. and, and put a lot, of, um, a lot of logic in front of me that this is what it was about, not just uh, floating along without hurting anybody's feelings. Well, if you're halfway between Satan <clears throat> camps, Satan's camp and God's camp, you're in the middle of the battlefield of the great controversy, aren't you? <laughs> You thought about it like that. Well, if we hold a grudge or fail to forgive somebody, what are we doing to ourselves? We hurt ourselves. We hurt ourselves. Yeah, we do. I believe it's, uh, I don't remember his name. A doctor said hating somebody or being angry with someone is like taking poison and hoping the person dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that I've, lo I've lost a lot of nights, lost a lot of, not whole nights, but hours of sleep at night over these kind of issues. Briefly, I'll try to, uh, I'll repeat a story I told once before, but this uh, motivational speaker a lady that I saw some years ago, uh, in some video, whatever, anyway, she was blind, 
and she was had been driving down the f street or freeway, whatever, and it's, somebody drove up alongside her and shot and took what with a bullet took out her both her eyes. Wow. And they understand asked her why she could be for, so forgiving. She says, you know, it's bad enough that I lost my eyesight, but I'm not going to let anybody else take the rest uh, any rest of my life that I have let to live by being angry and, and unforgiving. Mm -hmm. So that's that's. Uh, it was a good lesson for me to learn, anyway. Yeah. Well, Jesus actually gave us some directions about how we're supposed to take care of differences. They're found in Matthew um, chapter 18. Have, have a look at that. Matthew 18, starting with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But do it privately, just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses, as the scripture says. And if, we, and if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. And you notice very interestingly that um, who's writing this passage down? A tax collector. A tax collector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just in, in passing, you might notice it's the tax collector who's commenting about this. Um, so we can see some very practical applications to this forgiveness business. It can have just enormous... I mean, unfortunately, I'm afraid probably all of us know Adventist churches that have been split over some probably relatively minor issue. Whole churches that have been split. The problem arises, as I see it, is when we both think that we're correct. Oh, we, of course we're and correct. And I think we're always that way. <laughs> I, you know, I, I doubt that any of us goes into a conflict thinking that we're the r one in the wrong. Yeah. Well, but Paul, certainly we have examples of him several places <clears throat> in his letters to the churches <clears throat> where he certainly seemed to think that and instructed that uh, people in the, those churches, there are some people that needed to be gotten rid of. Yeah. And well, whenever these kinds of things happen that split churches, I'm sure that's exactly the way they, they think they're like Paul, each side. Yeah. I think a lot of these fights are distractions anyway. Yeah. They're like being, being <clears throat> powered by an unseen force, it seems like, and they're, they're concentrating on that when they should be concentrating over here. What Picking about, the wrong battle, actually. What about, what about theological things we're talking about? Our church, what about uh, 1888, yeah. 1901? Yeah. <clears throat> Weren't there people that disenfranchised themselves from the, the church and went off and did other things? Yes. And uh, so what's the scoop there? Did those people are... Everybody go after him and say we forgive you, or were they glad they were gone? Or well, here's here's one of the issues theologically, since you're raising that question. And, and we're we may be talking about two different kinds of forgiveness yeah. here. We're talking about what I think about you, mm -hmm. you know, and then what I think about this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's important to rem recognize that many of our Christian friends think that the only requirement for salvation is justification. And justification basically is another word, ultimately, for forgiveness. In other words, God isn't so sure about us. He's not at all sure about the bunch of sinners that are living down here on planet Earth. But if He forgives us, we'll make it into the kingdom. Okay. What's wrong with that kind of an approach? Do we want to be there? <laughs> um, yeah, I remember very distinctly a, a young man who was a part of one of my Bible study groups a number of years ago, and he grew up uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, and he just told us flat out, he said, as a kid, he used to pray that if anything was ever going to happen to him, if he ever had to die, that he would die on his way home from church on Sunday morning because he thought after confession <laughs> was the only time in the week that he was safe to save. I mean, you know, that's sad. It's really sad. Well, l look at these words from Ellen White again. Gospel Workers, page 499. Do not suffer resentment to ripen into malice. 
Do not allow the wound to fester and break open, break out in poisoned words which taint the minds of those who hear. Do not allow bitter thoughts to continue to fill your mind and his. Go to your brother and in humility and sincerity talk with him about the matter. Well, look at the example of Jesus. Uh, we've already mentioned very briefly, and I, let's go look at John 8. And, you know, Jesus healed that woman who was caught in adultery and all that kind of stuff, and then that led to a great discussion with the Sanhedrin, who had set her up and tried, they thought they had an airtight case against Jesus, and they were going to they were going to nail him, and he nailed them instead. And they came back to him, and they had this great discussion. And I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to read a little bit of it, starting from verse 21. <clears throat> Again, Jesus said to them, I will go away. You will look for me, but you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I'm going. Now, he's talking to the general conference of those days. So the Jewish authorities said, he says that we cannot go where he is going. Does this mean that he will kill himself? Jesus answered, you belong to this world here below, but I come from above. You are from this world, but I am not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins, and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. What's he saying there? What is the word I am who I am? Where does that come from? Yahweh. The name of God. That's the name of God in the Old Testament. They didn't seem to get the picture, and so... He said it again in verse 28, I believe, yeah. Verse 28, he said, so he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. And finally, they still didn't get the picture. Finally, clear over and down in verses 40, 40, 44, he said, you are your, the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. And what was, finally, in... Um, Verses, um, let's see, we're down here to 57 and 58. They said to him, he said, your father, he said to them, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. They said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? I'm telling you the truth, Jesus replied, and this time they couldn't miss his words. Before Abraham was born, I am. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Now, is that a good way to make friends and influence people? He didn't make friends with the priests, that's for sure. Well, why did he do that? Well, it was, it's good for us right now. It kind of confirmed who we think he is. He actually <laughs> said it. Yeah. It may not have been a great thing to do right then, but um, and it probably confirmed things for other people too. Oh. Well, but Jesus recognized, Jesus loved every one of those members of the Sanhedrin. And he realized what a bad situation they were in. And he was hoping to shake them up enough by what he said. So that, and, and what do we know? If you read over in Acts 15, verse 5, you'll discover that a few years later, after he was gone, many of the priests believed in him. So I think Jesus, I mean, by making these very stark statements, he, he, he shook them enough, up enough so they, some of them started thinking. Well, look at these words again from Ellen White. A very interesting article entitled Unselfishness Among Brethren, written in 1896. When the laborers have an abiding Christ in their own souls, when all selfishness is dead, now that would be all of us here, right? <laughs> When there is no rivalry, no strife for the supremacy, when oneness exists, when they sanctify themselves so that love for one another is seen and felt, then the showers of the grace of the Holy Spirit will just as surely come upon them as that God's promise will never fail in one jot or tittle. What do we need to do to get ready for the latter rain? Seems impossible. Wow. Well, once another, again, uh, we're running out of time. I want to read another very important uh, comment from Ellen White. If we look at our church, and now this is found in um, our Sabbath school lesson, but it's some, some quotes anyway. If we look at our church, that is a Seventh-day Adventist church as a whole, what is the greatest thing holding us back from the kind of revival and reformation that will be needed in order to reach the world? 
Is it our teachings and doctrines? Of course not. We all think we have all the right teachings and doctrines, right? Of course, our church leaders turned back the latter rain in 1888. They, we did, they didn't mention that. I added that. These are the very things that God has given us to proclaim to the world. The problem lies solely in us, in our interpersonal relationships, our petty jealousies, our bickering, our selfishness, our desire for supremacy, and a whole host of other things. Why must you, yes, you, not the person next to you in the pew, not the pastor, but you yourself, plead for the power of the Holy Spirit to bring the changes that have to occur in you before we will see revival and reformation in the whole church? And that immediately raised a question in my mind, will we see revival and reformation in the whole church? All 18 million of us? But one of the best ways to try to understand Bible stories is to try to put yourself into the place of those people and think of what you would have done. If you were Paul, what, you would have, what would you have done? If you were Onesimus, what would you have done? If you were Philemon, if you were John Mark, if you were Barnabas, what would you have done? Well, have you ever tried to use Matthew's advice, Jesus' advice as recorded by Matthew and, and reconciling yourself to a, someone else you think has done something wrong? How did it work? I don't see anybody busting out with an illustration here. <laughs> well, going back to Romans 8, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 8, you remember? talks about how, let's just look at the verse real quickly. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. J.B. Phillips is a very um, telling translation of that verse. He interprets Romans 5, 8 as follows. Yet the proof of God's amazing love is this, that it was while we were sinners that Christ died for us. That is probably a more accurate representation of what the Greek actually says. God's love is so amazing. I mean, what can we even say about it? There's no, you know, we sing about the ocean depths are not enough, the sky is not high enough, whatever. Could we learn to love even a little bit like God does? Could we learn to forgive people? Could we learn in meekness and quietness to, uh, you know, forgive them and, and become really the kind of church that God's looking for? If we could, we would see the end coming. See you next week.